Well, greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. We're glad that you could join us for our latest online program. Today it is Ask the Expert, creating an exhibit. We're going to talk to our senior curator, Tom Schieber, who's been a frequent guest on past programs here at the Hall of Fame. Uh, my name is Bruce Markison. I work in the education department. Uh, we will take your questions a bit later on in our Zoom group chat. You can type your questions for Tom in uh, a little bit later on in the program as we learn about the process. And it's not really a simple process. If you tuned into the first show we did on this a few weeks ago, uh, you know there's a lot that is involved and we're going to continue to dive into this topic with our friend and guest, uh, Tom Schieber. Tom, how are you today? I'm doing pretty well. I would say I'm doing pretty, I'm giving it an eight to eight and a half out of 10. Eight to eight and a half. Yeah. You're in your bunker in Milford, New York. <laughs> Milford, by the way, uh, we've never mentioned this, but Milford is a home to a former major league player. Really? A pitcher named Mike Barlow, a relief pitcher back in the late seventies and early eighties, pitched for the Blue Jays, also pitched for the Angels. And he actually went to Milford Central School uh, yeah. in your town. Uh, he was not born in the area, but did move to this area at a young age. And he's the only product of either the Milford or Cooperstown schools to make it to the major leagues. Just a, a, bit, of a, a bit of trivia to tie into the life of Tom Sheeper. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. That was excellent. And I will now promptly forget that. Yes. <laughs> We'll have to have Mike Barlow on uh, yeah. as a guest at some point. Today, though, we are going to talk more about the process of creating an exhibit. Uh, when we met uh, a few weeks ago to start this topic, Tom, we went into some of the early phases of the exhibit process. What exactly are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to sort of pick up where we left off. And, um, you know, we discussed about a lot of the early phase work. And uh, now we're going to talk about this really critical part of the process, which is coming up with what we call thesis points, the bullet points, the key sentences that we write, and we don't necessarily publicize, um, but but we it's sort of our guiding light. And everything we're doing is, are we hitting a home at the thesis to the exhibit? And uh, so, you know, last time we talked about creating an exhibit and how it's kind of like building a house. And if you're going to build a house, you don't just grab a bunch of wood and nails and hammers and start banging away. You have to have a plan. And the same thing with an exhibit. So, you know, we got to figure out the style of the house or who's going to live in the house or how it's organized or what rooms are going to be or where everything's going. All that kind of stuff is essentially the same with an exhibit. How are we going to put it together? So we'll talk about refining our concepts, coming up with those thesis points, and ultimately choosing the stories and the objects that are going to illustrate those stories that are really engage with our visitors. We were having a little bit of a laugh about our opening slide here that you put together. And it looks like a little bit of a mess, but it's <laughs> organized and it's all sort of aimed in the direction of creating an exhibit. And this is the process. It's all part of the process. It is. So I'm not going to talk today about the physical building of the exhibit. I'm not an expert with that, actually. Our exhibits and design team are the ones who really work on exactly what it's going to physically look like, how it's going to lay out in, in conjunction with the curatorial team. And then we have people physically building things. And that's what's actually just happening this picture. But I thought the picture gave an example of the building or creating part. But we're going to talk a little bit earlier than this process. Um, and we're going to take a look at actually two different exhibits that help illustrate um, what I'm talking about, coming up with thesis points and um, how we figure out what is it that we want to talk about. And to an extent, what is it that we don't want to talk about? So, um, and the two exhibits we're going to talk about are, are a whole new ball game which is on our second floor and is uh, basically about baseball from the last 50 years. That's a cent half a century. Holy cow. Um, and that's organized chronologically 
but with little bump outs that maybe take a look at one uh, story in a non-chronological manner or another story in another way. And the other exhibit we're going to talk about, just to help us give examples of what I'm talking about with these thesis points and coming up with the defining concepts, is one for the books, which is on our third floor. And it's, exhibit, it's an exhibit about baseball records. And this one is organized very differently than whole new ball game. This is organized uh, not at all chronologically. It's organized by the type, in this case, the type of records that we have, as you can see here, at the very beginning, we have batting records, but we have a whole section on pitching records and a whole section on fielding records. So that's the way we organized this one. Um, and those decisions are part of what we, what we brainstorm about is how do we want to organize the exhibit, just like you would decide how do I want to organize my house? Where do I want to have my living room? That kind of thing. So those are the two that, that I thought we'd talk about. So we have two completely different exhibits in terms of content. Again, a whole new ball game is baseball history from the last 50 years. Yeah. And then you have one for the books, which looks at baseball records, milestones, the stories behind them. Obviously, the content is different. But as yeah. you say, the way they are structured, the way they are organized, the different themes, all of that is completely different. I guess there really are no two exhibits that are done the same way here. You're, you're absolutely right, Bruce. It's, it's uh, you know, we might have a template for uh, generally how we want to go about creating an exhibit, but then oftentimes that exhibit takes over and it, and it sort of dictates, well, this is the way we're going to have to plan it. Um, they, no, no two are the same. And you know, I'm glad that's the case because if they tended to be cookie cutter and all the same, then we lose a lot of, um, what's special about them. So when you walk through the museum, you're not going to see the same look. You're not going to see the same exact form of pre presenting items. Um, each exhibit has its own distinct purpose and flavor and design. And I think that makes for a much re richer experience. I mean, it's almost like, uh, why would you want to go to uh, nothing but Italian restaurants? Sometimes you want to have Japanese food or sometimes you might want to have a home cooked meal or whatever. That's what we're presenting in the museum too. It's switching things up. All right, let's go back to the whole new ball game exhibit, which opened up about three years ago, as I recall here at the Hall of Fame. Um, one of the things we wanna talk about in creating the exhibit, knowing the audience. And you can say in a general sense, well, you know, shouldn't it be obvious? Baseball fans are the audience, but we need to get more specific than that. You're, you're absolutely right. And um, we definitely think about audience. Basically, um, I would say um, we have a lot of things we're thinking about, but that's the first thing I think about. I'm, I really try to put myself in the shoes of the museum goer and say, what's going to work for them? What are they going to expect? What are they not going to expect? Because um, it's fine to think about giving them something delightfully new and, and surprising. Um, and so, in this particular clay case, um, we were presented with something we, after doing a lot of thinking, we realized we have a unique situation with this exhibit. So unlike our exhibit, let's say on early baseball, the pre-1900 baseball called Taking the Field, or as another example, a Babe Ruth exhibit, um, also earlier in the same floor, when the visitor comes to whole new ball game, they actually lived through much, if not all, of the subject we're talking about. So a young kid who's maybe uh, 10 or 12, they certainly watched baseball over the last, or hopefully have watched some baseball over the last few years. We talk about very modern baseball. Or somebody my age lived through baseball in the 70s and 80s and 90s, et cetera. And so that's really important. That's not the case with um, people coming through and seeing the pre-1900 baseball exhibit or the Babe Ruth exhibit. We don't expect anyone to have gone in there saying, oh yeah, yeah, I, I lived through this. <laughs> That's just, you know, hey, if you did, great, but we're not expecting that, right? Um, so we realized that was a special situation with the, with the visitor. So we thought we have got to embrace that. That's got to be, that's a great, to, that's a, a great advantage that we know something special about the vast majority of the visitors. And that is they already have a connection to this era. They already have memories, whether the memory ha was formed yesterday or the memory was formed 40 years ago, whatever. Let's take advantage of that and let's incorporate that 
into the thesis that we need to write down to make sure that, uh, that we have a guiding light. We're always working, you can hear me say this a million times, we're always working to hammer away at and stick to that thesis point. And in this case, we basically came up with a pretty simple statement that we try to um, devote ourselves to. And that was, since around 1970, baseball has continued its long history of very dynamic change. And you, the visitor, have been a part of it. And that's, um, you know, this, we decided to talk about change because change is what helps, helps form memories. If you do the same thing over and over and over, things start to blur together. But if you switch it up, changes in baseball occur, you go, oh, that's, that's new and different. And, and that's what triggers your, your memory. That's what, what, what imprints something in your brain. Now, this is really one of the early parts of the whole new ball game exhibit when you first walk in. Right. And you're really struck by these very colorful uniforms. This certainly strikes a chord with me because this is when I started following baseball in the early to mid 70s. And I remember the bright maroon of the Indians, the Kelly green of the A's, the polyester uniforms introduced by the Pirates. So all of that is on display here. But you've also got some keywords. If you look to the right of that Indians jersey, I'm not sure how readily people can read those those words and phrases, but I, we can certainly read them from here. Yeah. Um, and these are some some broad themes you tackle here: Hammer and Hank, free agency, and the swing and A's. Right. Exactly. And I'm glad that those all resonate with you, Bruce. I mean, that, that's that's the idea. So. The, um, the main, and, and you're right, this is the very beginning of the exhibit, or, or, or almost the very beginning. And um, the main, well, I think about it, the main backbone to the exhibit is these very large cases that look just like that on the left, that we, the curators and designers called era cases. We don't, the public doesn't necessarily know that, but although now you know, but we call them era cases. And we think of, we thought of splitting up this large half a century of baseball into different eras. Um, so this is the first, you know, whatever, five or six years of the exhibit. Um, and we wanted, and you'll notice, by the way, nowhere here does it say this case is about 1970 to 1976, five, whatever that it is. You don't see a giant text that screams that out. We thought about this very carefully. And we thought at one point we were going to put that there. And then we realized, you know what? No. One, we don't want to pigeonhole ourselves. What if we get an artifact that maybe is one year off or whatever? We can still might be able to, this might be the appropriate place to squeeze it in. It's, it's not so hardcore that we can't have a little leeway here. Um, but additionally, we felt, you know what? If we're doing our job as curators and designers, this case, each one of these era cases should just scream the era through what's in it. So for me, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. Those the, the, the beginnings of this mix and match era of uh, that, that uh, Charlie Finley and the A's introduced. I mean, I just, I just, I see that and I think early seventies, I think of the, the dynasty, the, the A's dynasty or the polyester introduced by the, by the pirates when they moved to their new ballpark as exemplified by that Willie Stargell Jersey off on the right side. Um, and another thing we should not, we should point out here, it's partially cropped, but on the right side is a famous painting uh, of Tom Seaver, who of course just yeah. passed away, and uh, um, uh, by Andy Warhol, and that you know, talk about you know imprinting an era. Andy Warhol, uh, uh, that style that he used is is so of that time. So, um, you know, if we're doing our job, the case really screens us out, and people walking up to it who lived through it will say, yeah. I, I remember that event, or I remember that style jersey, or I remember that team, um, whatever it is. So um, that's exactly what we're doing with these era cases. Tom, I wanted to ask you about something that actually I've never noticed this before. Uh -huh. and I, I don't know why, but toward the bottom of the screen, uh, kind of underneath where some of the text is written, is that wallpaper? Yeah, well, what it is, it's a, it's a design element. And one thing that we did is um, in, in particular, some of these era cases had what we were calling sort of an icon story. 
something that is so iconic, so revered, so well remembered that we just thought we're just going to highlight. I mean, you listen, we're doing that with lots of different artifacts, but there was certain ones that were just so uh, of its time and so well remembered. Um, and so we decided to um, feature that and, and we wanted to call it out with a little uh, a video, which I'll talk about in a moment. And I'll, I'll talk about one of these in, in a moment. But that, that wallpapery look, which dip, is different depending on the era, we wanted that design to sort of also scream that era from a design standpoint. And we wanted to, to draw your attention to this because this, this is a very special object, a very different one. We'll talk about, uh, about one in a moment. That looks like the wallpaper from my kitchen circa 1977. The exact Perfect. same pattern, I believe. <laughs> that's, you know what? That is actually where we got it, Bruce. We, we <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the idea. Yay. That's exactly what we're trying to do. It's like really, so if you notice, you were mentioning the words that we, we wanted some key words like free agency or swing and A's. The style, the font style was ho hopefully also in keeping yeah. with that era. We're doing it throughout. We're trying to really be of the time. You know, you mentioned that, and I think of the television show Match Game. That looks like <laughs> the font yeah. that you would see on the back wall. All that's missing is Gene Rayburn and his microphone. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm totally with you. <laughs> yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, it certainly does bring back memories of that time period. Um, here we, um, we start to advance a little bit within the exhibit. Yeah. Um, some interesting items here. You have the, uh, the famous Houston Astros uh, so-called Tequila Sunrise uniform. This is actually one that belonged to the great Nolan Ryan. Right. Um, but you've got some other interesting themes here, including Whitey Ball, the Superstation, which I'm guessing is a reference to WTBS. And then, of course, uh, the Pine Tar game. Again, no dates here at all, but the right. keywords and the visual elements should tell us exactly where we are. You're right. And I will say that when we, when we formulated this idea and said, this is, this is going to be the backbone to the exhibit are these era cases that split up the time. The first artifact I thought about of all of, of half a century of artifacts. The first thing I thought of was tequila sunrise Astros Jersey. I actually wasn't concerned about whose Jersey it would be. Um, we end up use, using Nolan Ryan's, which is great. Nolan Ryan's a huge part of this era. So that, that yeah. works for that reason as well. But the really the first and foremost was it is so of its time. You look at that and you go, oh my gosh, it's mid 70s to mid 80s, right? Yeah. And remember, people look fondly back at this now uh, and they, and they, and you know, the, there's echoes of it at, with Houston now and they do the turn back the clock days stuff like that. But at the time, it was a very controversial jersey, and a lot of people did not did not like it at all. And it was, but it was very different. So it also addresses. Not only does it hit home at, oh my gosh, this is so of its time. So we've successfully done that. But it also talks about change. And in this case, changes on the field in terms of des design elements for uniforms. It's a niche little story, but it's an important one that really hits hits you and and people remember. I, I'll tell you another thing was that Mets jersey on the far right, who's in the jersey, I can't recall whose it is right now, but they also had those, the, it wasn't normal old stripes on the sleeves. It was the, the two-tone sort of blue and orange stripes. Yeah. Gosh, that is, that that's, makes me think of those of those 80s Mets, you know, the, the, the late 70s, early 80s Mets. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what's going on there. And actually, if we go to the next slide, you can see another era case that has all sorts of keywords like reverse the curse. So now we, uh, you know, just with those three words, a large percentage of people are going to know where they're at in terms of the, of this era. Um, Iron Man, core four. But another part is what artifacts did we choose to help hammer away at our thesis and of, you know, you were there. And tiny little artifact in the bottom left-hand corner, right below Jorge Posada's catcher's mask there, is a beanie baby. Yeah. I mean, beanie babies are so of their time, although they're still going now, believe it or not. But I mean, they, they, had a, they have a, a wheelhouse. And that's the beanie baby that was given away at Yankee Stadium the very day that uh, David Wells pitched his perfect game. 
So every person who was at the game, they got their free beanie. They didn't know there was going to be a perfect game. But when they went to the game, they got their free beanie baby. And so, I mean, the place was packed. And thankfully, <laughs> David Wells comes through with an, a very memorable ball game. And David Wells himself, during that heyday of David Wells, was an extremely memorable guy. He had an outsized personality. So, you know, and we talked about this before, Bruce, that the artifacts that you see, some of them are absolutely one of a kind and they're incredible moments. Other ones are not one of their kind. That Beanie Baby went out to probably at least 20,000, maybe 40,000 people. I don't know how many they were giving away, but a lot. Yeah. It's not particularly rare, but that really can resonate with people. You, either people who said I was there and I got one, or I love Beanie Boy Babies. I didn't realize there was a Beanie Baby baseball connection, whatever the case may be. So once again, it's really trying to exude this era um, wherever we're at. Tom, two things are striking me about the exhibit looking at these slides. Number one, highly visual, big, brash artifacts, colorful artifacts. Mm -hmm. Some of our exhibits tend to be more driven maybe by text because, or photographs because we maybe don't have a lot of artifacts. That's one mm -hmm. of the problems that people face when we try to Look back at the history of the Negro Leagues, finding sure. artifacts, uniforms, gloves that the players actually used. But this exhibit, it's heavy on artifacts, and it's heavy on big, bold visuals. And as is the era, right? I mean, the era is, is there's a, it's a boldness to the era. And as you see, and you brought this up, Bruce, take a look. We've got one of those icon cases there. And, and below the, the normal eye level, below where all that, that angled deck that has labels, you can see these these vertical multicolored stripes that are popping up under um, underneath um, that those iconic shoes that th that's from the reverse of curse. Those are Kurt Schilling's shoes. So um, that you know that's another thing we we try to have these visual and design cues that after a while you'll start to recognize them to go oh yeah or even you may not even um, consciously know that you're being clued into something special is right there in the middle of that case. In addition to the stripes, I also noticed the blue background. Uh, is that, was that a, a, a color that was picked for any significance or did it just help show the artifacts better? It's it, mostly the latter, but it, you know, it, we could have done white, we could have done gray, but um, yeah, th that, there's a, th a theme to the color scheme as well. Yeah. I'm not as well versed in that as our design team is, but but uh, yeah, we want to make sure things that one, you, nothing's clashing. You don't want to be, uh, you don't have your eye, um, have eye problems when you're looking at an exhibit. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it doesn't need to be bland and let's not make it bland. Now let's um, advance a little bit further here. We see some twins, some Cardinals, some Red Sox. We yeah. see the Mid-Atlantic something a little bit different here. Yeah. Um, we're now into, I guess, um, the, the early 2000s or the 2010 and on era. Yeah. Um, give us kind of a general theme of what we're seeing here, including the, uh, I don't know if that's a wallpaper design, but there is a design at the bottom of the screen once again. Yeah, so so uh, well, another icon story there. Uh, listen, here's, here's some words, fear the beard. Uh, uh, the re you know uh i can't see what it says i think it says uh replay something but it has to do with the you know instant replay being embraced by baseball right so you know we got we got our era in just a couple of words um and you know the 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 david freeze jersey from game six of the 2011 world series one of the most celebrated games in in recent history when the cards made not one but two improbable comebacks before in the 11th doing a walk-off. So you have two comebacks and a walk-off. And that, is that memorable? Absolutely. For Cardinals fans, absolutely. For Rangers fans, absolutely. And I think for a lot of just baseball fans, right? Um, so it's it really screams its time. And um, and that's true of a lot of these. I love the fear of the beard part. We, have, we show one of these uh, right in the center of the case. You can see uh, underneath the green jersey uh, and underneath the cap is one of those faux beards uh, with the fear of the beard. Um, and, you know, so, so uh, talking about the Giants dynasty and especially the early part of the dynasty, uh, once again, we're just hammering away at these iconic and memorable events and moments and styles um, that our visitorship is going gonna, is gonna to get because they were there. 
What about the Mid-Atlantic Jersey? That's something that maybe doesn't strike a chord immediately. Right. So, um, you know, as you know, not everything in um, the Baseball Hall of Fame is Major League Baseball. We're not just uh, focused on Major League Baseball, although the vast majority of what you're seeing is related to this top echelon of the game. But we talk about everything baseball. We're happy to talk about those stories. And we did the same thing in, in Whole New Ball Game. So uh, this is a jersey that was worn by Monet Davis in 2014. Um, and when she pitched, the, first of all, she was the first girl to earn a win and pitch a shutout in a Little League, Little League World Series victory in, in, in history. And um, you know, this, this is a really important and very cool moment. And also, I think sort of a, a, a milestone marker that is in people's memory banks. Um, so yeah, you know, it's like I said, not just major league and how cool is it that we have this story from the little league of a young woman who is extremely talented right next to the Jersey from Derek Jeter, one of the most celebrated ball players of the last uh, quarter century. Right. You know, uh, I just think that's wonderful. I imagine this created a little bit of a dilemma, a tough decision. You have the Monet Davis jersey, which certainly fits into baseball of this era, the 21st century, yeah. but it also fits in with the Diamond Dreams, women in baseball exhibit. Right. How do the curators come to a decision there? You obviously can't split the jersey in two, although actually that happened with the David Freeze jersey. <laughs> That's another story entirely. But normally you don't split a jersey into two. So how do you decide okay, we're going to go with Monet Davis here and not in Diamond Dreams. Right. And actually, well, in this case, it, it's moved. It, you know, it's, it's not, these things are not set in stone. Now, it doesn't mean that it's at any moment, it's super easy to move an object. It takes a lot of work. People don't realize how much work it takes to take an object off exhibit, put one on. There's a lot to it. And hopefully these series give you a little feel for the kind of thought process and effort that goes behind all facets of what we do at the museum. Um, but in this case, we did move it. And you know what? It might move again. Um, not, uh, the other thing to, 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 to understand, and this is not unique to baseball history, it's, unique to, it's, it's true of all of history. History is every ch ever changing. The way you look at history, what happened in the past with what we, you know, the way we learn things, we learn new things or new angles to stories. So just because something happened in the past doesn't mean we are done thinking about it or we are done learning about it. As a matter of fact, in a real way, we hope we're just beginning to learn. I hope that by someone seeing that David Ortiz uh, um, shirt, which he never wore, but that was um, placed uh, at um, the Marathon Bomb sighting, site, um, they'll learn more about it. And they'll, 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 they'll ask questions. Why is this here? What's the story there? Um, so, you know, it's... A, you know, you're a big part of the education department, and you know everything that we do here is is really education related. We want people to learn and ask questions and and uh, um, and question things. Um, and so, moving artifacts around or changing the way we handle the story is par for the course. Not easy to do, like I said, but it's par for the course. But you know, these era cases are not the only way that we presented this exhibit. That was just what I call the backbone. Um, if you jump to the next slide, you'll see that we, another thing we thought of was so much of what the visitors bring to the table since they lived through this era is that they saw these many events. Sure, some of them, some of the people were fortunate to see them in person at the ballpark, but the vast majority of us saw whatever event or moment or style or whatever on Sports Center or on television in general of the uh, you know, game of the week or now on your telephone on the on the web so you know i wasn't i wasn't living in la when when fernando valenzuela when fernando mania was was just a craze in the early 1980s yeah. so what we did is we put the, together these four giant walls of screens it's, it's, it's four uh, monitors that make what one giant screen and it's a huge touch screen actually. And on that left-hand side, there's a, whole, there's a list and it goes much larger than that. You have to sort of spin it a little bit with your, your hand or with a stylus during the pandemic. And you can choose 
an event, a moment, something you may have recalled or maybe something that's new to you. And it'll show you a video clip of anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute and a half, something like that, that's a highlight. Because so much of this era is about, uh, to boil it down to one thing, TV, whether the TV is delivered on your on web or, or through sports or whatever. It's, it's these video replays uh, um, that where, you, oh, I was there. I remember that. I remember watching that highlight. Um, and then additionally, if you go to the next screen, we'll get to what I was talking about and you were alluding to earlier, which is we even have some small videos um, next to these sort of icon cases. And this is the one that I think of the most. Um, and it's really the reason why we decided to do these icon videos, where we paired it with an artifact and an important story. Um, and this is the one for the George Brett Pine Tar Bat. So I'm going to assume that the folks here tuning in uh, know about the George, George Brett Pine Tar game. I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining how that is a fun and wacky and crazy event. Look it up if you don't know about it. But the point is, um, we have the bat uh, on loan from George Brett, thanks, thankfully. But we, we had that bat on exhibit in the previous version of this exhibit, essentially, where it was the end of the timeline. Um, um, and we explained what was going on in the label, um, but on a number of occasions, walking through the museum, I and other people witnessed the following. A parent with their child pointing to the bat, explaining what it was all about, and then ultimately pulling the phone out of their pocket, their cell phone, and bringing up a video to really, because you really kind of have to see it to get it. And actually you have to see it even if you already know what happened because it's those images of, of measuring the bat and calling George Brett out and George Brett jumping out of the dugout and flipping out are so, are so wonderful to see and so uh, um, of their time. And um, we thought to ourselves, yeah, we, why are we making our visitors do this work? You don't want to make visitors do a lot of work. You want to just engage with them and then relate yeah. stories, right? Why do we? Why should they pull out a phone and 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 try and look up the pine tar game? Let's just show it to them. So it's on an endless loop there, whatever it is, maybe a minute and a half or two minutes that basically show the story on an endless loop. So th that was kind of like the poster child for for that concept. We're going to have an icon. We're going to surround it with the color of the background. We're going to really highlight it. We're going to have a video about it. We're going to have some. Uh, some a design element, a wallpaper, whatever you want to call it, that goes all the way down to really draw your eyeball to these um, signature events. Now, is that being displayed on an iPad? No, it's not an iPad. It's a little video monitor. Really? Okay. Yep, yep, not an iPad. Don't need to I touch it because it's in a case. <laughs> yeah. I want to go back to the larger screen here because yeah. I've never really understood this technology, and maybe you can explain it to me. <laughs> We're looking at this uh, video of Fernando Valenzuela, 1981. Are we seeing, is it four actual separate screens or is it just one big screen with black lines running? How do they do this? Yeah, so it's, it's physically four different pieces of hardware. Well, they're all the same hardware. Four different screens that the computer, one computer talks to, the computer splits the images into four large images, sends one of them to the top left, sends another one to the top right, whatever. So because a screen that big is very problematic, uh, it's, it's t believe me, it's tough enough to pull it off with four screens, but one really giant one is problematic. So, yep, there are four different pieces of hardware there. Oh, that's interesting. I'd always, I'd always wondered about that. Now you know. Um, yeah, let's continue um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, looking um, uh, through this exhibit. Um, here we have uh, some different themes here, the designated hitter. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the first DH, Ron Bloomberg, is going to be joining us for the a virtual author series in, in a couple of weeks. Um, he and uh, his co-author, Dan Schlossberg, uh, they have a new edition of their book out, uh, The Designated Hebrew. It's a great title. And Ron talks about being the first DH, also about being a Jewish player back in the 60s and 70s. But here we have the DH theme explored and then also some, uh, some other changes going on here as well, Tom. Right. So another part of, uh, of the exhibit is so we've got our era cases, we've got our um, our giant monitors. We have our icons with li little tiny uh, endless loop videos. Another thing we do is we have 
um, on the right side there uh, of what we call our focus cases, and I'll get to that in a moment. But on the left side, you see a monitor. It's a giant touchscreen that talks about the designated hitter. And we have a number of these um, that are basically, we thought, you know, people have lived through this era. They have a lot of opinions about hot button issues, controversial issues. Let's let them speak out about that. So we, on Twitter, we asked people, send in your thoughts. What do you think about this? We took those thoughts and we would pair them with one another, one person on one side of the issue, another person on another side of the issue. And then we asked the visitor through this touchscreen interactive, which ones do you agree with? And you, and you slide, I agree with the one on the left, or I agree with the one on the right. And you get to participate in essentially voting on which way you feel about things. And then at the end of asking about, we ask uh, four or five, maybe six questions. At the end, you can see um, where you uh, line up. And then what the, you know, thousands and thousands of people have been participating in this, um, what the average person is doing. So whether it's the DH or talking about Pete Rose or talking about uh, labor strife between uh, management and labor and all, all sorts of different issues that have really, uh, um, people who have, feel strongly on both sides of the issue. Yeah. So we talk about that. But if you, if you switch to the next slide, you can see these focus cases that I'm talking about. Um, the one you just saw, which had to do with um, significant changes on the field, like DHs, or like the change uh, in uh, um, uh, the use of relief pitchers is a super important change during this era, um, or the habit of maple bats. The one we're looking at right now, we called Baseball Operations, which we love that title. And this is about um, uh, basically uh, sports medicine in this era and specifically surgery. So we talk about um, Tommy John surgery and we talk about um, uh, the angled bat that you're seeing on the right there, Dustin Pedroia's uh, axe handled bat, which he used because he had his handmade bone removed and it's much easier on the hand than the traditional knob bat. So you get changes in equipment due to surgery and due to injury. Um, so we have, so these are some of the cases that are not chronological. We're just doing a deep dive into what we thought was a very interesting story. So yet another way to slice it. So there's lots of different things going on in this exhibit, different ways to present the material, but all the while we're delving into our thesis points, we're engaging our visitors, we're doing it in different ways, with different stories, through hundreds of artifacts, videos, images, ephemera. Yeah, some labels that, that are going to make, make it a little bit clear what's going on. Always with the same goal, and that is fulfill our thesis so that the visitor has a cohesive and great experience. And that's, that's the core of what we're doing. Just to clarify here, the, those are not actual human bones. We are not the <laughs> Mutter Museum from Philadelphia, which has that sort of thing on display quite prominently. Thank you for, thank you for pointing that out. You're absolutely yeah. correct. But those yeah. are, the, but above those non-human bones are actual surgical instruments that, are, that were used in early days of Tommy John surgery. So game used, game used. <laughs> Now, Tom, is it safe to say that in terms of video, this is maybe the most technologically emphasized exhibit in the museum? Um, yeah, especially because we do it in, in multiple different ways. We've got the giant walls, right? Then we also have the Ask the Visitor interactive stations about um, uh, their opinions about, about hot button issues, plus the in-screen... Uh, endless loop videos. So we do it in a lot of different ways, but you know what? There's a lot of other exhibits that, that utilize um, uh, uh, interactives in interesting and unique ways. I, I, I will say, and this is an important thing to take away, when we're doing an exhibit, we don't go in saying, oh, we got to have a lot of interactives. Um, we go in saying, we've got to have really good stories and really engaging artifacts. And so if it works best to tell a story with an interactive, We'll go that direction. Right. But if it works best to do a, a high tech, let's say, but if it works best to do a low tech interactive where you just maybe ha have a little uh, um, panel that you may maybe move or you reveal something, great. 
or uh, quite frankly, that's simpler. They're more they're remote, more robust. They don't break down this easily. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a lot of money. The, the high tech interactives. So we don't tell a story. We don't use a method just because it's whiz bang. We yeah, do it yeah. because it's the best way to deliver on our goals. Um, so yeah, the, the minute you start thinking about you put the cart before the horse. If you start thinking about oh, it's got to be whiz bang. Then you're doing yourself and your and more importantly your visitors a disservice. So we've looked at um, a whole new ball game. Now right. we'll take a look at the other exhibit that you had indicated uh, would be part of our demonstration today. Very different exhibit. It is up on the third floor. It's a little bit older than the whole new ball game exhibit, but it's one for the books, looking at baseball statistics, records, milestones, and more importantly, I guess the stories. Uh, behind those as well. Right. Uh, so let's start with the question we posed for a whole new ball game. What is the audience for this exhibit, one for the books? Right, and you brought up a really good point early on about this, Bruce. You're thinking like, what do you mean what's the audience? This is people who were came to the museum, right? And yet we do have to think about them differently and what they bring to the table. It's not just what the curators bring to the table. It's a two-sided conversation here. So what do the visitors bring? And one thing we thought about was, you know, we have a, a very, um, lots of different kinds of visitors throughout the museum, okay? But specifically for this exhibit, we're thinking about, we've got the guy or, or gal who is a hardcore baseball record nut, right? Somebody who's just really into it, good for them. That's awesome, we love them. They're gonna be very knowledgeable. But we might also have, and we probably do have, the vast majority of who, people we have are people who are eh, somewhat familiar with some of the records. Maybe they're pretty well familiar with records that have been set the last few years. Uh, they've heard about um, that Babe Ruth used to have the record for home runs, but then it got broken by Hank Aaron and now Barry Bonds has it. Um, you know, th they may have a certain level of knowledge, but not they're not the hardcore Uber record person. And then you know what you might, and, and we certainly do have people coming to the museum who aren't interested in records. They could care less about records. Or uh, quite frankly, they're not really there other than to hang out with their spouse or their kid or whoever. Um, so the, the interest level and the knowledge level is very different throughout the museum for visitors. But we thought, especially for this one, how do we think about that? How do we make sure we don't ignore any of these? It's not, we, we're not going to just talk to the hardcore record person and ignore and make a bad experience for the other two uh, that I've talked about. So how do we make sure we do that? And then another thing we thought about, and this I think is probably going to be surprising to a lot of people. This exhibit is on the third floor of a pretty large museum. I think a lot of people are surprised at how big we are. And that means that most likely people have spent a decent amount of time in the museum already. They've gone up a bunch of stairs. They've seen a lot. And you know what? They may have driven to Cooperstown that morning. Well, if they drove from from uh, New York, they, that's, that's a you know, three and a half, four hour drive. Um, so they might be dragging a little bit by this point. Boy, we really need to make sure that we don't make this a boring exhibit. Now, we do need to make sure that all the time, right? But it's even more of a challenge that we're, because we know that people have had a lot of museum under their belt already. And on top of that, the challenge was, it's baseball records. I could easily see that we could just toss a record book up on a wall, essentially. Just take a bunch of records, stick them on a wall. And that's probably what the first thing someone would think about if they said, oh, it's an exhibit about baseball records. It's like a, a here, look, I got a, I brought a prop with me today, Bruce. This is a, a sporting news record book from, well, I don't know, 2000, 20 years old now, okay? We could have just taken this and all of these numbers and all of these stats and, and specifically records, most this, longest that, whatever, and put them on the wall. And that would have been a disaster. It would have been boring. And maybe for the Uber fan, they would get into it. But you know what? They're better spent back at home looking at their record book. That's not what the idea of an exhibit is. It's not to be a book on a wall. So um, let's make sure that we keep the audience and this, these different members of our audience engaged and invigorated. So we didn't just stick a record book on a wall. What we did is we started thinking about record books and we thought, well, what is it about record books that's good? And what is it that's about record books that isn't gonna work for an exhibit? 
And we thought, you know what's really great about a record book is it gives you the hardcore facts. It tell, essentially, it gives you the who, what, when, and where of a ton of records. But it does a rotten, rotten job. It doesn't even really attempt to do much of a job of telling you the how and the why oh, behind cool. the records. And frankly, that's where all the good stories are. The how and why is what is going to allow us to make this exhibit vibrant and entertaining and informative. And so if we combine that, the part that isn't in the record book, the how and why, while still paying special attention to the fact that many records are just amazing and really cool and worth celebrating, the very basic concept, that's what had led us to our, our, we had two thesis points for this very large exhibit. Um, and those are baseball records represent the very pinnacle of achievement in the game. And some of those records have even reached this sacred status amongst baseball fans. And the other one is the more we learn about the how and the why of various records, how and why they were set, the more it becomes clear that records are not really simple facts and that comparing records, one record to another record, one record holder to a previous record holder across a super long history of baseball is like comparing an apples, apples and oranges. It's just, you can't really do that. And we hope to hammer away at that fact. So here we have most triples in a season by Chief Wilson, 36. Right. That sounds like a record that's never going to be even approached. Right. And it really only happened because of weird circumstances to begin with. And that's what this exhibit explains. Exactly. Exactly. So you did a great job of giving the who, what, when, where, right? The, what is the record? It's, it's most triples. Uh, who said it? Chief Wilson. What's the number? 36. When was it done? 1912. Boom, 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 boom. If you just looked at that, you would just say to yourself, man, that guy had a lot of triples. I mean, it's very rare in a regular season today, that's a full season, to get double digits in triples. Yeah. I mean, that's really impressive. This guy had 36. Well, you would walk away going, well, yeah, that's, that's uh, insane. I mean, that's, he, he must have been an incredible triples hitter. And when I think of a triples hitter, my triples hitter is a guy who hits hard liners down the line, let's say, or, or in the gap in a wacky – a ballpark that has weird angles and the outfielder's chasing after the ball, or maybe the outfielder fell down on the ball, that kind of thing. But usually you're thinking about a guy who can hit hard, who's got a lot of speed, right? Hack Wilson, and we talk about this, I'm sorry, Chief Wilson, um, was not that guy. Um, what happened was, and we tell this story, is that in 1912, most of Hack Wilson's triples actually were not line drives down in the corners. They were hard hit uh, and uh, almost home run type balls that hit over outfielders heads. Mm. Now, nowadays, if you hit a ball over an outfielders head, unless he totally misplays it, it's in the stands. It's a home run. But back then, Forbes Field, which had opened just three years earlier in 1909, it was huge. And so you could, and remember 1912, there's not a lot of long balls being hit. So the outfielders, first of all, are already a little bit closer than they would be today. Yeah. Here you have Chief Wilson, who's actually kind of more of a home run hitter. So he, had, he would hit these long balls that would go over the outfielder's heads, but not into the stands, on the ground, and then they roll to the wall. And actually, if he had a lot of speed, he might have been able to get a home run out of it, but he hit it. They turned into triples at Forbes Field. Well, of the 36 triples that um, Chief Wilson hit, two-thirds of them, not half, two-thirds were hit at Forbes Field, even though half of his games were played at Forbes Field. So what we did is we showed an image of Forbes Field, which is the, um, it's a little bit hard to see. That's a three-dimensional uh, diagram there that it sort of goes into the wall. But the big hole is Forbes Field. The smaller one that's bounded by brown, like a, like a uh, um, warning tracks, that is PNC Park. You could fit PNC Park into Forbes Field and look at all of the extra room. So Forbes Field is much larger, and we thought that was a good way to show it because we didn't have an artifact from Chief Wilson's record. So um, we thought, let's, sh let's graphically show the how and the why, the story behind the record. 
Here we have another part of the uh, One for the Books exhibit. We see Ricky Henderson uh, raising the bass. Um, here we're looking at records kind of in an innovative, unconventional way. Explain how you do that with this. Yeah, so this is the bass running section of the exhibit. And if you look um, almost in the very middle, but a little bit to the left, you'll see three yellow bars that are almost all the same height. And then to the right of them, a big green bar that goes way up higher. That's a little bar diagram showing the total number of stolen bases in a career by the top four guys. So uh, left to right, that's Ty Cobb with 897 career stolen bases. Billy Hamilton, the, the older Billy Hamilton, not the modern Billy Hamilton from the 19th century with 914 career stolen bases and Lou Brock who just passed away with 938 stolen bases. And then compare that to Ricky Henderson, pardon my dog sparking, they love this part of the exhibit as well. Uh, but th the Ricky Henderson bar goes all the way to over 1400 stolen bases, right? Yeah. 1406. So first of all, just graphically you can see that essentially Brock and, and uh, Cobb and Billy Hamilton are essentially tied. I mean, really, they're very, very close. But here you have Ricky Henderson, who has way more. He's dwarfed them. As a matter of fact, get this, Bruce. He has 468 more home runs. Uh, excuse me, 468 more stolen bases than Lou Brock, than the second place guy. There are less than 50 players with, four, with 468 or more stolen bases. So the, the margin that he beat Lou Brock by would have put him in the top 50, all, just, the mar, just the part, the gravy that he got beyond Lou Brock would have put him in the top 50 of stolen bases all time. But the other thing we did, and this is, we really wanted to show a number of records in a very unconventional way to engage with the people who are not the hardcore fans and the hardcore record nuts, but more the people who are um, trying to look at this anew. We measure the distance. If you, you know, when you steal a base, that's 90 feet you get. You get 90 feet that you stole. So you do 90 feet times 1,406 bases and you get almost 24 miles of stolen bases. Think about this. Ricky Henderson almost ran a marathon sliding 90 feet headfirst and 90 feet at a time. So we, we really want to give a different take on it. We do that with a number of different um, records. Now here's an interesting situation involving Rogers Hornsby. And it's a situation where we don't realize that the guy has a record until many years after the fact. Explain what I'm talking about. It's a little complex. And, uh, uh, and I encourage you to come to the museum. To, uh, you're here, Bruce, but, but people come to the museum and, and, and take a look at it. But um, what basically happened, and this is just one example of it, but there's a number of times it's happened. But we thought this was the best one to give an example of because it affects a record. The record for a long time was uh, who holds the record for most consecutive batting titles. And the answer for a long time was Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb won nine straight batting crowns. That's pretty amazing. Um, as it turns out, modern day research, well after Ty Cobb passed away, um, uh, showed that in 1910, in the middle of the season, actually at the, near the end of the season, it, um, a, a league record keeper incorrectly dated the second game of a Tigers versus Red Sox doubleheader played in late September. He, it was September 24th. There was two games played. They accidentally said game two happened on September 25th. Okay, so that's a mistake that was made. Well, at the end of the month, just a few days later, the record keeper noticed the error they made. They said, oh my gosh, I, I have totally, for well, he thought he noticed it. I totally forgot all about the second game of the doubleheader on the 24th because he didn't see that second game on the 24th because he called it the 25th. So he went to every single Tiger and he added in that second game right after the end of the September um, uh, entries. What that meant was there was a double entry for all of these guys in the Tigers. Well, that when the season was over, they discovered this. They said, oh my gosh, there's a double entry. Now, and so they went through every single member of the Tigers and they crossed off that extra entry. Oh yeah, we don't need that, that's an extra one. It was just misdated before. They did it for everyone except for one ball player. They forgot Ty Cobb. Or some people think 
they intentionally let Ty Cobb have that extra two for three, which meant that he beat out Lajway, Nap Lajway, for the batting championship. But if you take away that two for three, Nap Lajway wins the 1910 batting title. This is a very controversial battle t- batting title at the time. And even today remains pretty controversial for the, that, like the person I was telling you about, the hardcore baseball record keeper. But everything points to the fact that no, Lajway had the higher batting um, average that year, which means that was right in the middle of the streak of consecutive batting titles that Ty Cobb had, which means he in he no longer has that record for most consecutive batting titles. It goes back to Rogers Hornsby, who did it in six consecutive years, and there's no controversy over that. Now, it's a little complicated, but what it really tells you, and what I'm trying to stress here with the how and the why, is you know, records and statistics, which is the backbone of records, are not perfect. They're done by humans. Humans write them down and humans make mistakes. Is this the only mistake ever made in the vast mountain of statistics in baseball history? Absolutely not. But this is one that affected a record. And you know what? There's other ones that affected records too. So, you know, people love to think of the baseball records and baseball statistics as being infallible. They're very fallible, let me tell you. Uh, And um, uh, this is just one example of that very complex story. So, you know, once again, we're having these artifacts and pictures and moving images and whatever we get our hands on to tell these key stories in this case and one for the books the how and the why and celebrating these records and we try to tell them in an engaging and an interesting and a fun manner so we can educate and entertain and and surprise and delight our our uh, visitors um we just do it in different ways in different exhibits one of many very interesting stories told in the exhibit one for the books We are going to take questions for Tom in just a moment. You can write in your questions in our Zoom group chat. Uh, Before we do that, though, we just want to mention that uh, we would love to have your support for our programs, and you can support them by becoming a member of the Hall of Fame's membership program. If you become a member, you'll get a full roster of benefits. That includes unlimited admission to the museum for a full year, Also, six copies of our terrific uh, magazine, which is done in full color, Memories and Dreams. Uh, Benefits of membership cannot be held solely in their hands for some. And membership brings with it the knowledge that you are a part of baseball's history. If you'd like to help us out, be a part of something greater, visit baseballhall.org slash join. We will now go to the questions for Tom Schieber. We've already got a few. Uh, We have a gentleman named Ted Curtis, who is joining us today, along with uh, his Lynn University sports management class. Uh, Ted says, I'm here with my students today. To what extent do you move artifacts in or out of exhibits as it is timely, uh, especially relating to milestones or in what we've seen, sadly, over the last week, the passing of a great player like a Lou Brock or a Tom Seaver? Right. Um, so kind of as of what we alluded to before, we do move artifacts around. Um, not very uh, often, uh, it's not going to happen uh, w- once a week or even, uh, you know, multiple times a, a month. Um, but depending on what story we're telling, and especially if we're opening a new exhibit, we have to move uh, artifacts around. So, uh, you know, for example, when we did the exhibit one for the books, we didn't... Um, we had a lot of those artifacts having to do with baseball records were scattered throughout the rest of the museum in other exhibits. Mm -hmm. And we actually very early on during the process that we've been talking about the process of creating exhibit, we realized this would be much more of an issue than we were having when we put together um, uh, most other exhibits. So when I was doing the Babe Ruth exhibit, I wasn't really quote unquote, stealing Babe Ruth artifacts from all over the, uh, the other exhibits and leaving holes. You leave these holes behind. What are we going to put here? But with the baseball records, we thought, oh, we're going to be leaving a lot of holes behind. What do we do? And what we did is we actually assigned a task to one of the curators. And we said, one of your main jobs is to focus on filling the holes, <laughs> dealing with the, the, the fallout of objects moving. Um, because we just knew there would be dozens and dozens of objects moving from other exhibits. How do we deal with that? And it was, a, it was enough of a problem. We thought we got to assign this as a significant task that someone's going to be doing. Um, so we think about it a lot. 
um, we, uh, and, and it ends up happening a decent amount, but like I said, it's not, it doesn't happen willy nilly that we put a lot of thought into it. And, um, you know, we've got a, it takes time to write new labels. It takes time to, to take care of that object, make sure that maybe we need to do some conservation on it, all sorts of factors involved, not simple. Um, one thing that we do that it doesn't affect the exhibits themselves, but it affects the plaque gallery. And unfortunately, we've had to do it twice in the last uh, seven, eight days. When a Hall of Famer passes away, we do, um, we do some things to honor them in the plaque gallery. And for those who haven't been to Cooperstown to see this, what exactly is done? Yeah, so the way we honor uh, Hall of Famers who have recently passed away is first of all, we put a floral wreath around their plaque. We really highlight that. Um, I think it's a really respectful thing to do. I, I think it's a wonderful tradition we've done for quite a while now. And the other thing we do is we put together um, a short biography um, that's longer than what you see on the plaque, um, but to give a better uh, a, a feel for um, that player's career, uh, both on and off the field, uh, just to give a little bit deeper context you know, the plaque is, a, is, is not giant size, and um, when we're putting together the text for that plaque, um, it's, very, uh, it's very celebratory, and it's very, uh, there's a style to it that we, that we keep to. Um, and the, the ability to do a, a, a little bit more deep dive bio uh, to, to pay our respects uh, is, is something that we, th we just felt was a, a very helpful and a respectful thing to do for uh, the memory of a fallen Hall of Famer. We have time for one more question. It comes in from uh, Mike Swartz. Uh, what does the Hall of Fame do if it doesn't have an artifact that they need for a new exhibit? So there's a crucial artifact that we're missing to tell the story. What do we do? Do we cancel the exhibit? Uh, <laughs> do, we, do we have a loan? What, what can happen? Yeah, there's a lot of different things that happen. So uh, we, first of all, I will say this, uh, we have a fantastic collection. I thank my lucky stars every day, literally, that I get to work with this collection and so do the, my colleagues, because it doesn't happen particularly often that we go, there's a critical story here. We got to tell the story. It hits so home with our thesis points. I'm coming back to that again. How can we not do it? Um, but we have nothing to tell that story. So sometimes we'll think of an innovative way to do it. For example, I really think the Chief Wilson uh, triple story is a great example of what that exhibit's all about, because you totally would miss understanding that record if you didn't know the how and why. But we had nothing from him. But we thought of a, a, a good way to show it with to all graph, modern graphic elements to, to show the difference in size between Forbes Field and PNC Park and to give that feel. So sometimes we'll go with a graphic element. Sometimes we'll really think out of the box and we might use something that's a little bit less obvious. Maybe a magazine cover can help do something for us. Maybe um, a photograph, maybe some moving images. Um, we'll think, we really try to think as we say out of the box uh, on these objects, but sometimes there's no replacing it and, or there's, the, or the, it's just not gonna work to think that way. We just have to get the obvious object X, Y, or Z. And then what we'll do is we will look into getting loans. Listen, when you go to the museum, if every object that's in the museum is from our collection, unless it explicitly says otherwise. So go ahead and look through the, the exhibits and you're gonna find very few labels that say at the bottom, loaned by yeah. uh, so-and-so. Um, that's great, but you know what? Sometimes we have to go outside, and, and I've worked on a number of exhibits where we did do that, and, and, and thankfully, fans and teams and ballplayers and families are very generous, whether it's with a donation or with a loan, um, and um, yeah, that's the direction we'll go. Well, great stuff as usual, Tom. We do uh, appreciate your time. We kept you a few minutes extra today. So we'll have a little, we'll have a little something extra for you in your next. Uh, <laughs> no, next you won't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next time we appreciate it. Uh, good stuff. As we look at the process of creating an exhibit here at the Baseball Hall of Fame, we thank everybody for joining us as well. It's a beautiful day here in Cooperstown. Hope it's good where you are as well. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.